you know, it, so it's just really, really basic, basic, basic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I will be telling the story in narration, but, but um, assume nothing in so far as um, what anybody knows, sure. even what I know. And I'm going to be representing the audience, so I'm going to sort of ask the, you know, well, what are you, you know, what are you trying to do here, and you know, that kind mm -hmm. of question, and just, you know, keep in mind that that not you in talking that you need things on hand to show I don't know what we're going to do I mean you can pick up some of this stuff I guess or what's yeah, behind I just you. wanted to see what was in a given box yeah. you got some really good stuff sort of I mean mainly it's 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 a conversation you know I just it's the ABC of it mm -hmm. what what are you doing why are you doing it when mm -hmm. did you start and what's your point sure. and and in the most Simple, short, brief, the kind of primer, you know, sure. that's, that's okay. really what this, this part of it is. Um, do you, how are you, briefly, um, what, got you, what got you started in this? My father was a general practitioner in New York in the 1960s, and one day when I was editor of my high school newspaper, he put a copy of the Surgeon General's report on my desk and told me to read it. And he was, you could say, one of the infantrymen in Luther Terry's War on Smoking, the Surgeon General who released that report. And it became quite an obsession with me after reading that, that we needed to do something more about it. In the 50s, he and I would watch baseball games and see the Dodgers sponsored by Lucky Strike, the Yankees sponsored by uh, Camel, and uh, the Giants sponsored by Chesterfield. And uh, he was just outraged at the thought that, the, that they were promoting uh, cigarette smoking in association with sports. So your father's outrage led to your outrage? I think that if you look back and say, uh, what's the single biggest factor, uh, it's certainly my father's interest as a family doctor in, in looking at, uh, not just in the office setting, but in the community setting, was the biggest inspiration. Well, that's interesting. Did he live to see you go on to do this? No, uh, my, no, my father died when I was a senior in college, and so he didn't even know I went to med school. But, uh, uh, you know, over the years I had, I had written a little bit about it in high school and college, and uh, so that's the influence, though. So, grad so you've been doing this gradually for a long time. Really? I've been, what he said, he said, we had this big old WebCore tape recorder, and he said, you've got to tape record these things, because one day people won't believe that they could be promoting L&M for water skiers or Lucky Strike for baseball players. He says, no one's going to believe this. So I have some old tapes from the 50s of uh, old radio and TV commercials for tobacco. And that's really starting, uh, th that's what started the collection that we have. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. OK, tell me your, what's your biggest gripe? Who are you, who are you maddest at? You know, when I go to, um, a tractor pull sponsored by Red Man Chewing Tobacco or a tennis match sponsored by Virginia Slim Cigarettes. I don't get as angry as the tobacco industry as I do uh, at the, the, the health bureaucracies in our society that claim to be doing so much about this issue. What do you mean health bureaucracies? Well, there are various organizations that uh, are not there, are not there with us. Uh, uh, they will pass a resolution saying, oh, this is bad, but they don't go out to the events to see for themselves. They're not out there saying that this is absolutely uh, a horrible thing for kids to be associating with. And uh, basically, it's just business as usual. You're going too fast. So let's start, let's just go back a little bit. Who is it that you're, who is your program directed against at the, it's not, you're not after the smoker. You're not after the companies, I don't think so much. Who are you after and why? I guess our goal uh, when we started DOC in 1977 was to laugh the pushers out of town, to use humor and ridicule to be uh, a, a different influence on the community than the tobacco and alcohol pushers. And when you find that we're not even allowed to put up our billboards, uh, then you begin to realize that the, the power of these industries is so enormous. Well, who's to, who do you blame? Is it the, is it the company? Is it the advertiser? I mean, who are you against? Who are you? Who, who are you? Who do you? Whom do you target? Doc is a very positive group. I mean, it appears that we one of those uh, anti-smoking or anti this or that. That's not true at all. You don't say when a cancer researcher wins a, a big prize for some new breakthrough that that's an anti-cancer fanatic. So I think similarly, what we are is very much uh, anti-Marlboro anti-Camel, anti-Miller, anti-Coors, and anti-Budweiser. And those are very major advertisers on network television and other uh, media corporations. And it's very sensitive in this country to even begin to criticize them. Because they say, of course, as Anheuser-Busch says, oh, we don't want kids to drink. And the tobacco companies say, oh, we don't want kids to smoke. 
I don't know who else does then. I mean, the fact is the kids are doing it, and, and they are blameless in this regard, using cartoon characters in cigarette ads and uh, athletes in beer ads. It doesn't add up, and everyone knows that. So who's the villain? I think the villain is basically the, the, the tobacco and alcohol industries, but more importantly, the media corporations that uh, know right from wrong and choose rather than to say, my God, this is an epidemic that's killing 100 times as many people as all illegal drugs combined, to choose to go along and uh, be uh, part of the status quo and not really raise questions about alcohol and tobacco promotions, particularly those tobacco promotions now that are getting around the law by such events as the Marlboro Grand Prix on NBC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, why don't you, I mean, people might say, I'll be the devil's advocate, uh, look, nobody's forcing anybody to smoke. Um, isn't it up to the, a person whether he or she smokes? I mean, the, the, the tragedy of the belief that no one's forcing anybody to do anything in our society, that's true. Uh, in fact, we have the greatest society in the world. Our vehicle for communication is advertising. I love advertising. I, I'm fascinated by it. But I think advertising can also be used for the positive good. When you want to get your boys in the Army in this country, the government pays for advertisements at the Super Bowl. Join the Army, USA Today, full page ads. Join the, but do you think our government really wants to keep kids off the biggest single killers in our society, tobacco and alcohol? Not a chance. So I, I think it's really um, a matter of putting your money where your mouth is. And in the case of our government, they don't do that. In the case of many of the voluntary health agencies, they don't do that either. So you feel the government really should be advertising, doing the kind of advertising? Put it this way, if the government or the American Cancer Society would take out paid counter-advertising to laugh the tobacco industry out of town, Doc wouldn't be in business. There's some elemental failure on the part of these organizations to understand that in our society it pays to advertise. It pays to sell your campaign. And by the way, the message is not just don't smoke. I mean, everybody's heard that since the Surgeon General came out with that 30 years ago. The key thing is to keep in mind the next time someone says to you, oh, come on, everybody's heard about smoking, it's dangerous, and they've made up their own mind. You have to respond by saying, hasn't everyone heard about Marlboro? Why do they have to be up on every scoreboard in every Major League Baseball stadium? Why do they have to be everywhere with his country music or rock and roll? Because they know what works and they know where our kids are. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that, where our kids are. I mean, um, what particularly bugs you about this? I think, again, it's funny, everyone, this is not a person in the world who'd be for smoking or for drinking or for drugs, but the problem is that those people who claim to be fighting the, big, the great fight are, are well-intentioned, but I don't think they realize that they just don't work nine to five. Our whole effort, Eric Solberg and I literally start going to work at five o'clock, because I'm a physician in the daytime. We understood that that's when the tobacco and alcohol companies do their best work. They know where the kids are, when they're going to be there. They work with a map and a calendar. And about the only weapon we have at our disposal besides counter-advertising is a camera. When you take a camera to these people, such as the Houston International Festival, we, had a, a, we didn't even have any film in it. We had a video camera. And they said, no, no, don't take our pictures. Don't. You think that they don't want their pictures taken because they're doing something right? They know exactly what they're doing. They don't want the context of what they're doing controlled by opponents of what they're doing. What is it that they're doing? Basically, at the Latino and black uh, parts of town, their marketing to these ethnic minority groups is so intense that uh, they're basically giving away T-shirts, caps, pens, pencils, timers, watches, radios, literally for a pack of cigarettes. No, no, no other company does that kind of thing. And so by controlling that and by showing the intensity of that, by photographing all the billboards, all the point of purchase displays, showing how these stores have been literally overtaken by these companies, we're able to go to black leaders and say, this is the area that we need to see more effort in. And this is what's happened now in Philadelphia with the Uptown Coalition and other groups, but it's coming very, very slowly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a similar question, and if you, don't worry if you repeat sure, yourself. I know, sounded too long. You know about this. Um, no, 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 it's, it's fine. I just wanna get it in another way. Um, you're not the only physician who's against smoking. Uh, why? have you decided to go about it this way rather than the trying to get patients not to smoke way? When you see people coming out on a conveyor belt, uh, let's say people who smoke, and you're trying to get them off the cigarettes, so that's a very gratifying feeling. I, I enjoy because I enjoy having them go out of the office saying, gee, I never thought about it like that before. 
instead of talking about the filter is safer, we point out that the filter is a fraud. Filter cigarettes are much more dangerous than non-filters because they concentrate the carbon dioxide and the cyanide. People don't know that. They say, wow, I didn't know that. They don't know that menthol is an anesthetic that deadens the throat and gives you the illusion that you're smoking cooler. So all these little consumer tips are very important. They don't know that a pack of cigarettes is very inexpensive. So you're paying like $1,000 for a pound now of popcorn. Now my question is, I think, I, I think what I understand from you is that your focus is not on the right, victim, I, I was but on... Right, oh, okay. yeah. So what's right. the answer to the, the question is, many physicians are against smoking and try to get their patients not to smoke. What's the difference between, what do you do that's different? As much as I feel gratified in working with people to get them off cigarettes, I think it's important to look that we have 1.5 million Americans stopping smoking every year, one way or the other. And we have an equal number of kids, 12 to 18, taking it up. If you've reached your 18th birthday and you haven't started smoking, you have very little chance of doing so. It's about 1 in 10. So clearly the marketplace for the future is kids. And it doesn't mean going to kids and saying, don't smoke, it's bad for your health. It means laughing at them. And when you see the kids laughing at the barf borough man, you know, this is one of our mm -hmm. examples, the, uh, the, the barf borough man, the guy that throws up into his cowboy hat, or, uh, you know, <laughs> laughing at the camel cartoon character as, a, as just a, 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 you know, a dirty, sloppy animal. I mean, it smells bad. That kind of thing. Uh, yellow teeth and zoo breath just don't make it with kids. And they enjoy laughing at it. When you turn the authority figure into the Marlboro Man instead of parents or teachers or doctors, the kids appreciate it. And the best line I use with kids is, you still smoke? You're 15 and you still smoke? Come on, you're too old to smoke. That's for the little kids. Mm -hmm. It drives them crazy. They can't stand that. Mm -hmm. Because everything we teach kids in society is, oh no, you have to be grown up to do all these things. And we're eating our young. We're, 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 and they pick up on the hypocrisy. But mainly, again, getting back to what you do um, as opposed to, I mean, mainly though you don't, you're not directed at the consumer, at the victim, you're directed at from the other way, you am I not right? In other words, I'm sure you do. You, you, as you're saying, that you have a lot to do with patients and trying to get them not to smoke in this very creative way. But mostly, your focus is not on the pe on the victim, right? It's on. So that's what I want you to tell me. Most of our focus in Doc is not on the the victim of smoking, uh, but rather on the whole society and how our attitudes can be changed. We work to change attitudes, not to change health behaviors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I and why did you decide to do it the way you're doing it? I mean, what's the, th the original thinking that went into your target group? My inspiration is Mad Magazine and, and other satirical and, 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 and humorous magazines that kids enjoy, that kids realize. And when you can get kids to to relinquish the, the common definition of what an authority figure is and take a look at, at the Marlboro Man as being the real authority figure, that's what gives us a charge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And who thought this up? Well, I, uh, I thought up Doc when I was uh, coming out of the hospital one day as a resident or, or physician in training in Miami, and I, I was driving home having just talked to a, a patient who was dying of lung cancer. And, and as I started to drive home, I looked up, and there were all the billboards for cigarettes, no matter where I looked. And rather than just say, my God, there's nothing we can do, I said, well, what about the billboard next to it? Could we get up there alongside of it? And so that the presumption is that everyone wants to ban everything. We don't want to ban anything. We think the cigarette ads are so ridiculous now that once people see them as ridiculous, there's nothing they can do to get our kids. They can give them toy racing cars, you know, they can give them uh, hats, caps, whatever they want, but there's nothing they will be able to do because they're pushers. So, okay, now we're getting to it. So your notion is not to get the advertisers to stop, but... Our notion is basically through a little bit of, 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 of a dose of humor to laugh the pushers out of town, mm -hmm. to, to point to the billboard next door as saying, that's a ripoff. And when people are, are you know, people are motivated by advertising. There's, there's no reason why they can't be motivated by counter-advertising. So you're fighting fire with fire, so to speak. Right. Is that it? You're... You're advertising, too. I think advertising is the greatest vehicle. We'd love to be on TV and radio. One of the best examples was the fellow who, uh, through a couple of million dollars in advertising, was able to get the food companies to stop using animal fat in many of their baked goods. That only took a very small advertising campaign. We'd love to advertise mm -hmm. on NBC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's the, that's the key to the future. It's not talking about or giving lectures in schools or, or what have you. The reason I go out into schools is I learn from the kids. I hear what's going on in their minds. I'm not up in some government think tank trying to tell kids don't smoke. Who's financing you? 
Doc is solely sponsored by ourselves. We get money from the few doctors that are willing to give it, and uh, mm -hmm. we have a lot of medical students, and uh, we don't have any major grants. Mm -hmm. We've had one donor who's uh, given, our top grant has been $15,000 from a publisher in New York who's uh, uh, been terrific. Well, how can you do it? Because what you're talking about is counter-advertising, and advertising is expensive, so... The, the beautiful thing about what we've done is, is, is to show how effective in just these little model efforts that we've done can be. As an example, when in Aspen, Colorado, uh, the, the Danny Sullivan Marlboro Celebrity Ski Challenge was about to take place two years ago, we called the Aspen paper and took out a $450 ad that instead of saying, go to the Marlboro Challenge, we call it the Barfboro Challenge, and we had a guy throwing up onto the ski slopes. And we listed uh, the farcical nature of celebrating death uh, with athletes and so forth. That caused such controversy that Aspen said, no more, no more Danny Sullivan Marlboro Celebrity Ski Slope. Now, that's just one example of a very small advertising campaign. Do you worry about, do you ever worry about being tasteless? You know, the, the, the tastelessness of the tobacco and alcohol industries is so, is so obvious that there's nothing that we could do. There's no language we could use and no pictures we could show that would be more vile. You know, the, the alcohol companies talk about, um, they actually take over Mother's Day for all those bottles she gave you, Bailey's Irish Cream, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I mean, I don't know anyone who's going to give their mom a bottle of booze for Mother's Day. <laughs> you know, give her a picture of cirrhosis. Uh, but the key thing is to take a look at how with just a, a, a calendar of events, mm -hmm. they can take over each of our holidays. You know, Halloween, which used to be trick-or-treat for UNICEF, is now the third leading alcohol selling day of the year. It, it, when you tell me the, an example, and you used a very good one, if you would use the example of the San, what happened in San Francisco last weekend, what, does that illustrate what you're talking about? What happened there? In, I, in fact, I don't even know, because we've got so many things going on. But I, I, in 78, we started. I'm uh, sorry, Phyllis, what was that? San Francisco, Virginia Slims. Yeah. They, had, they were outside. You know. Tell me about that event. I mean, what 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 was the what was going on there? I think that often we do things just to keep our own sanity. That if you have eight thousand people going to a cigarette sponsored event and no one else says anything, then it's it's very depressing to me. At least they'll know that we're following them, that we're watching them. And uh, these people, they had six people on me when they came to Houston. I mean, just because they, they, they don't, they're very scared of anyone saying anything about their products. In San Francisco, we had a few medical students and others out to call it the emphysema slims. Uh, you've coughed up long enough, baby. And we had Martina, Martina no Smokanova, a big guy <laughs> in a blonde wig. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that you need to do is to poke holes in these institutions. Does humor work? Does it get people to smoke less? I, I guess after doing a thousand presentations in schools and medical societies and so forth, the, the thing that keeps me going is uh, that uh, one group hears about it and they say, hey, you know, why don't you come and talk to us? So I think we've motivated people through humor. They're getting started. We have some satisfaction that we've gotten communities. Did, uh, Phyllis, I'm not Did sure. We Did we... Did we make the point yeah, well, about, um, all right, where do you, uh, while well, that thought's in your head. It's the same comment you were asking me about, you know, why aren't you just talking to patients about smoking? You know, okay. That's a, okay. Go ahead. Well, it's very gratifying to talk to patients about smoking and very gratifying to get them off cigarettes. The fact of the matter is when you can reach millions of people at a time, that's the way to go. What we're doing today in the so-called anti-smoking movement is the equivalent of spraying DDT in the room of people who already have malaria. We're not going and draining the swamps. We've studied the tobacco industry like a parasitic disease. We know how it operates, and I don't think anyone else is doing that. We've shifted the focus away from the smoker, away from lung cancer arguments, and, and, and away from the substance, tobacco, and onto Marlboro, onto the way in which it's promoted and the pushers. You call these ad you call the advertisers pushers and other unattractive names. Is that harsh? I always love when advertising agencies say, oh, we have a conflict of interest. We have two soap companies. We can't do that. But they don't see any conflict of interest in, a in representing a health insurance company and a cigarette company, or a pharmaceutical company and a cigarette company. Advertising people, with a few exceptions, like Emerson Foote, who relinquished uh, all tobacco accounts, uh, are shameless in, in, their, in their inability to, to forego cigarette accounts. Have you ever been sued? A couple of years ago, when Randy Quaid came to town for 19 months ahead of time, they had a 19-month advertising campaign for Miller Lite beer. We're having a party, the world's largest party. 
And, uh, you know, this was going droning every night. The kids were saying this to benefit the Special Olympics. Can you believe this? With the kids with fetal alcohol syndrome. So we created a T-shirt uh, that instead of saying Miller Light Beer, we're having a party, we said Killer Light Beer, we're pushing a drug. And on the back of it, we had what you do naturally when you drink beer. You throw up. So it said, uh, uh, they're pushing a drug, we're grabbing a potty. And uh, the companies didn't like that. And it's funny, Surprise. you Surprise! Know, well, you know, I mean, in this country, I think it says that you, that you can still burn the flag, even though I would never do that. But I would think that a group of doctors could make fun of a beer company. But not according to Philip Morris, which is the parent company of Miller Brewing. So they sued us in state court until the judge reminded them of something called the Bill of Rights. Well, it just so happens that Philip Morris is touting the Bill of Rights now by taking a copy of it all over the country. And so when some of the humor colonists around the country got wind of this, um, they, they took care of that, and Philip Morris withdrew the suit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, why is this so important? The, uh, you know, I, I guess when any physician gets involved in anything, uh, you, uh, you have a dedication to an area, whether it be uh, cancer prevention or heart disease prevention, whatever. that's just the nature of what we do. I just find it endlessly fascinating that people do not understand what we do. Uh, and since smoking is about the easiest thing in the world to, to follow, um, we're called anti-cancer uh, uh, fanatics. But um, no one will, uh, you know, I'm going to just take Okay, take start again. To, you know, By the way, is that, is that air conditioner possible oh, oh, to turn? Cold, it's huh? getting frigid. Am I there? Is it just Yeah, me? it is a little cold. I'm just starting to turn blue. I feel that, just slightly yeah, I if just you, was gonna, thanks Eric, okay. Start your thought. Why again. is it so important? Okay, yeah. I was on an airplane recently, and a guy sitting next to me asked me what I did, and I said I work on one of the largest medical centers in the world to prevent cancers and heart disease. He says, Doc, that's wonderful. That's oh, I admire you so much. He says, By the way, Doc, do you think there's going to be a cure for cancer in our lifetime? Like the program is saying. I said, Well, it's funny you should ask because over 40 percent of all cancers now are entirely preventable. He says, How's that? I never heard. I said, Well, just take smoking. I didn't even get the word "smo" out before he was calling me some kind of anti-anti-smoking nut. And so, it's it's we're so programmed by the tobacco industry to believe that anyone who wants to raise a question about its lethal products is some kind of a fanatic. That it's a challenge to us to overcome this label of being negative. What we want to do is save people's money, uh, get them not to be ripped off, save the kids from having to watch parents dying of this kind of nonsense. And I think that the tragedy of what the tobacco and alcohol industries are doing to our kids is something that presents a challenge to us. Is it mostly the kids, or it, is it mostly the kids? Are you mostly concerned about children? The name of the game is children. Um, it's it's the, the whole future. If we constantly stop, to, if we constantly are saying that everybody's heard the warnings, or they've seen the warnings, or they've they've heard about the dangers of smoking, and we still see all these ads. What, what, that, that's, that's just nonsense. There is no anti-smoking campaign. When was the last time you saw an anti-smoking commercial? They don't exist. I think if you want to say that, that kids are, are very important in society, you don't aim at kids. The industry says we don't aim at, at, at children. If that's the case, why is it that any five-year-old can name you three brands of cigarettes, but ask a child to name you three brands of cigars, and they can't do that? Cigars are for adults, cigarettes are for kids. They go where the kids are. Mm -hmm. Nights, weekends, holidays, wherever the kids are, that's where you'll find the American mm -hmm. tobacco industry. What, um, you spoke to some kids this morning, to some uh, high school kids. Yeah. What, what are you trying to accomplish with that kind of talk? The thing that I tell uh, the high school students, and above all the medical students, is that there's less of a difference between them and me than there is between the day that they decided to go into a health profession and the day before that. Because society... Too complicated. <laughs> okay. Why, tell me what you have in mind talking, you know, trying to involve other people, yeah. just as simply as you can. We just want to tap the highest level of commitment of every student to be a teacher. The teacher is the highest calling. So that junior high school kids can go and teach the elementary school kids. The high school kids can teach the junior high school kids. The college students can be taught by the med students. It's, it's, a, it's a very exciting opportunity. And often, the med student is more credible than I am when he goes out to a high school. Actually, the meaning of doctor is teacher, isn't it? That's right. Doc, or which, you know, from doctors, doctors, the, the word educate is the same word as, as doctor. Mm -hmm. 
But I started Doc and got the name because my father was a doctor, and everyone said, hey, Doc. And he had a very positive image in the community. Uh, I think, unfortunately, the image of the physician has been of, of economically well off and not mm -hmm. consistently opposed to the kind of forces of bad health in our society that are calling the shots. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is try to counteract that. How are you able to do your, how are you able to do doc and also continue to be a physician? There's, there's, you know, I, I think if you look back and you see what, uh, what this is, you don't believe how much material you can accumulate. Um, what do you do? Don't, don't you sleep? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it's a very, that's a very personal, sensitive question. I don't know how to answer that uh, because it's very heart-rending, you know. I don't, I don't know. I think what I would like to be doing is doing doc and also learning from my patients. And I get to do that here now. This is the best of all possible worlds because I can learn what's going on I can interact with medical students, and then, of course, we can apply what we're learning, but there just aren't enough hours in the day. And you have a family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see them? Well, you'll have to ask them, but no, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, uh, but I, I think the, the uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough to answer the questions. Okay. About, you know, I don't okay. like to get personal. Okay. Okay. So it's, okay. it's just, uh, yeah. do, you, do you consider yourself a nut? You know, I couldn't care less what, what other mm -hmm. people regard me as. I was a medical editor of medical journals, and uh, I had the philosophy of a famous pathologist named Virka who said that no one could publish in his medical journal unless they were willing to be made a fool out of in public. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't care if we make fools of ourselves every week, because this is an issue that uh, I think the public is going to mm -hmm. come to in, in sooner or later. No, no, there's no question. You're right. I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, because it is interesting. Aside, I mean, this is a profile aside from the, 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 the very important issue you're talking about, and it's, I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, you know, the other part that's interesting here is what, what is it? Wh you're, you're clearly obsessive about this, and, and however noble your cause. I mean, other people might care about this, but they wouldn't go to the lengths that you've gone to. And I guess the question is, why is it so important to you to have gone to the lengths to have it take over your life as it has? I, I think, that basically, the, the reason why we go to great lengths to do this, Eric Solberg and I spend 14, 18 hour days, is that we're obsessed with it because we don't see anybody else doing it. Our colleagues in Doc, Dr. Richards, Dr. Fisher, Dr. Houston. I mean, I can name on a handful. We have, we have handfuls of colleagues that we work with every day, the med students, but we don't see anybody else doing it. I don't think, on the other hand, we're doing anything different than a cancer researcher is doing, studying uh, virus causes of cancer or, or an AIDS researcher and studying the causes of AIDS. We're just doing this because we realize the causative organism for the tobacco problem is the tobacco industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your goal? I, th I think if, if uh, I had several goals, one would be that uh, we would really truly raise children in an environment where they had a free choice, and not just which brand to buy. You know, the cigarette companies made only about 10 brands that had 90% of the market back in 1950. Now these same companies make about 400 brands. It's all the illusion of choice. There are 30 Marlboros, Marlboro Lights, Marlboro Longs, Marlboro Ultralights, Marlboro Reds, Marlboro Mediums. It's all a game. It's all consumer fraud. Cigarettes are consumer fraud. And I think that, that that consumerist approach is where I think people will, will, will succeed in ridding our society of these menaces, not in constantly emphasizing how dangerous something is. Because that's just not how human nature works. If you tell someone not to do it, they'll do it. So when will you quit? <laughs> what's your, uh, what would it take for you to quit? I think what's going to happen, I think before the turn of the century, you will see tobacco industry executives going to jail. I don't think there's any question you'll have some state's attorney generals who will realize that they are violating the law on television advertising, on, on uh, other advertising, that they've disproportionately targeted minority groups, that they've done things that in any other decent society would not be tolerated. Mm -hmm. So I think that would make me very, very happy to see uh, the tobacco industry put on the defensive for a change. And uh, I, I think that uh, kids are going to be the people to do it. Mm -hmm. Are you hopeful? You know, I'm, I'm optimistic about being in a society that gives us an opportunity to do this. Um, but in looking around the world, 
at Eastern Europe, at Southeast Asia, in Central and South America, the tobacco pandemic is making our pandemic look small. The tobacco industry is a merciless, shameless industry that's going all over the world, hooking kids left and right. And I think ultimately there's no optimism in what's going to happen. And uh, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's gone beyond anything that we can do if we fall into the trap of believing that there's this great war on smoking. Sure, we've gotten some clean indoor air laws on airplanes, but we haven't really removed society's influences to, to start the problem. We haven't taken even a close look at cigarette advertising and how they're breaking the law. How are they breaking the law? In 1971, the tobacco companies said that they would get off the air. They did that in order to prevent the counter ads from still being shown. The fellow named Bill Talman, who used to be on Perry Mason, the Too complicated. Attorney. Sorry. I know, I know yeah. it has to be. But okay. In 1971, the tobacco companies crossed their heart and hoped to die if they ever got back on television. And that eliminated the anti-smoking ads. So what you had then, starting the very next day, instead of Marlboro cigarettes, you had Marlboro racing. Marlboro horse racing, Marlboro auto racing, Virginia Slim's tennis. So they never did get off the air. That's breaking the law, but we haven't had an attorney general that would enforce the law. Why not? Why don't they? When you consider that the tobacco industry is still perhaps the leading contributor to presidential and other political campaigns, it's just frightening. I mean, I couldn't believe the AMA gives $13,000 to Jesse Helms, the, the most ardent supporter of the tobacco industry. We can't still have the, 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 the banner of saying we're fighting this problem and then turn around and aid the very enemies of good health. What has surprised you over the years doing this? What's, what have you learned? How have you, what way have you gotten smarter about it? I think that I, I've come up with enormous, uh, it's when, you, when you're fighting a disease that just you can't seem to beat, it's, it, you, you almost have a, a, uh, an admiring relationship with it. I think uh, the, the tobacco industry is about the cleverest and most dynamic industry in the world. They can change their, their identity so quickly so that they become Marlboro cigarettes, then Marlboro racing, Marlboro fashion, Marlboro clothing, as quickly as you can bat an eye. Are you a match for them? There's no, all we can do is just catalog it. All we can do is just try to keep up with them. And when you consider that there are over 3,000 events locally sponsored by tobacco companies, there's just no way to keep up with them. So, what, so why do you go on? I guess if we didn't do anything, um, it, 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 would, it would basically they just win everything. At least we're maybe preventing them from taking all our kids. Good. Okay. And that's, that's the I think you made that clear. I yeah, think okay. that's, that's, that's fair. Now, the only thing we didn't do is this stuff, you know, but um, this is, you know what this is. It's camera stuff, and I'm just going to be talking. Just look at her and listen. And, um, no, I, um, I just like to throw everything in there and see what, you know, in the pot and see, <laughs> see what boils. Um, but, uh, I like the question you, about funding. You're, because, uh, don't, don't talk. Oh, just a little bit more. Um, because, uh, you know, I know also, I know you've done this a lot and, and, uh, to try to, uh, you know, sort of get something that isn't tough. Family therapy. I see. That type of thing. In turn, to see adults. We see babies and, uh, older people too. Mm -hmm. Can you just get him talking for a minute? Oh, if you keep talking. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll tell him what you did today. Just talk about. Okay. Um, well, we started off by going to the high school for the health professions, where there were about 250 kids from the ninth and senior grades, and uh, talked to them about laughing the pushes out of town and medicine versus Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the other folks went to KTRU, I think it is, right? Is that the right? Mm -hmm. Which is Rice University's radio station, where we played our ad, which is the um, uh, Addict the Poor to Educate the Rich ad that we're running. And uh, then we've uh, How come you over. How that schedule tonight? And what's your biggest gripe? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know the routine. Yeah. Um, what's your biggest gripe? When I go out to all these events, the Dakota tractor pull and all that okay. stuff. That's good. Okay, uh, who are you after and why? Mm -hmm. uh, who are you after and why? Well, obviously kids are the most important. Okay. Okay. Who's the villain? Uh -huh. Who's the villain? Not only are the tobacco companies and the alcohol companies the obvious villains. Okay. Um, you're not the only physician against smoking. Why do it this way? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
You're not the only physician against smoking. Why do it this way? I don't think that most physicians are aware of just how. Okay. Uh, do you worry about being tasteless? Mm -hmm. Do you worry about being tasteless? Not at all. Okay. Uh, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Like any area of science. Okay. Um, when will you stop? <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what will it take? Yeah. What would it take to get you to stop? It, it's when will this fight be over? Go ahead, answer. Do it again. And I'm sorry. That again. Yeah. yeah. When will this fight be over? That's very, very hard to say, given what they're doing in all over the world. It's mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to do the nut question? Or <laughs> no, I, I won't. No, no, no. Let's, let's see if we can eliminate that. Because you use the word fanatic. Do you, cons do you consider yourself a bit of a fanatic? Well, I guess so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what about the... Guys? Shh. Two, two, three. Go ahead. Okay. What's all this? Well, this is just a small uh, example of some of the 1991 materials that we've gotten. People send us things from all over. A patient's, uh, patient gave me this, a, a Marlboro uh, child-sized sweatshirt from uh, China. Wait a minute. Should we do this yes. again? Don't you want okay. him? Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go? Okay. Okay. What's all this? Well, actually, we've got uh, just a small fraction of our 1991 collection. People send me things from all over. This was a little child sweatshirt, Marlboro, sent from China. And this was something we got over here at the Astrodome, the Camel Supercross hat. Someone sent me this from Malaysia, camel uh, uh, jockey-style briefs for men, uh, and... Uh, Are the companies giving this stuff away, or...? Oh, no, they're, they're at a nominal cost. They're I very see. inexpensive. Here's what we just got last week. In fact, this is a tumbler for two-pack purchase. They actually only cost me one pack because they were trying to give them away. And here's a, a cooler, and uh, camel's the biggest marketer around. In, in Spanish and in English, uh, they market uh, lighters and so forth. Uh, just mm -hmm. basically giving things away. This was a, a photograph. I thought this was fascinating. The Boy Scouts were honoring tobacco company executives. Uh, this is from a tobacco industry newspaper. Where? Where was that? Oh, that was in the Greater New York Council of the Boy Scouts of America. Recently honored industry members at its food, beverage, and tobacco industries luncheon. Mm -hmm. uh, here is Michael Kerrigan, the Smokeless Tobacco Council president. You know. Do people send you this stuff? or? Oh, yeah. We subscribe mm -hmm. to a lot of the tobacco industry uh, publications, but... Uh, uh, we get stuff from all over, and uh, this is, by the way, I saw this in a clothing store in Malaysia, a free t-shirt with a $150 purchase. Uh, no warnings there, I mean, uh, they're really uh, all over the world now. You buy $150 worth of cigarettes? Yeah, they're a little, no, $150 worth of clothing. Of clothing? This is a clothing store. This is not a, this was a camel clothing store. Oh, I see. Right, and you got a free t-shirt. Oh. So you bought uh, clothing and got that. And uh, what else do you have? There? Well, we got uh, T-shirts, of course. Uh, naturally, uh, Dakota. Ours is, of course, Dakota Dakoff, the cancer Dakoffin. But uh, um, it just goes on and on oh. around. But what are wh we're in a way we're too into it. What mm -hmm. what is all this stuff? Mm -hmm. What are these things? We're documenting what they do. That's basically it. We're just cataloging, as you would the human genes, and finding out where things go. We understand, or we like to think we understand, how they operate. I think instead of a they, we need. Oh. So that, okay. Yeah. So, what what do you, what do we have here? We're basically trying to um, to study the tobacco and alcohol industries as you would a, a parasite. And uh, <laughs> in order to do that, you've got to know what they do, and we have to be out of the office and trying to track them down in the community. And what is this stuff? These are things that people have recognized as a little bit uh, strange for them and they've sent us things like this or things that we have bought because we feel that this is very important to okay. document. These also. are things that the alcohol and tobacco companies right. advertise. Just, again, right. you're too interested. Sure, okay. Okay, what is this? These are small samples of what the tobacco and alcohol companies do to hook new users. Like how? Well, I don't know of anybody else that gives you free T-shirts if you buy a pack or two of cigarettes. I mean, a $10 T-shirt for a couple of bucks, is, it's, just, it's just not done by anybody else. What else? Um, almost, uh, we, we, of course, we take lots of photographs. This is the Houston Chronicle newspaper with a cool cigarette display in the wall of the Houston Chronicle. Um, this is the Skull Bandit uh, Speedway out, uh, just out of town, uh, a Dakota billboard. Uh, Co-sponsored, the Skull Bandit is co-sponsored by one of our biggest supermarket chains. Huh. A little cartoon character there. I mean, you, you pull out, you put your finger in and pull out a plum, and 
This was at a Latino uh, music uh, festival. I think not photographs. They're a little yeah. hard to show. What else? What other stuff yeah. in terms of well, the... in supermarkets around Halloween, uh, of course, the, uh, the the light beer pumpkin and the scream for Miller uh, things. These are ephemera, and uh, I think by saving them, people will realize that uh, the alcohol and tobacco companies tried every trick in the book to get to kids. So what, what do you do with this stuff? We publish about it. We write about it. We, we describe, uh, for instance, that when the Marlboro Grand Prix auto race, all of this over here is auto racing, um, they have associated themselves with uh, um, the whole notion of, a, of an auto race car. See, someone gave me this. Uh, Dr. Davis gave me this. And uh, we go out to the... Uh, uh, the drag races, if you'd like one of these, uh, okay. um, and uh, we we show that the the Marlboro Grand Prix auto race televised uh, a couple of years ago in a one hour and a half auto race had 5,900 mentions of uh, of uh, tobacco pumpkins. I should say that here's Camel actually there. Mm -hmm. So we've we've you know as they've shifted away from promoting directly saying buy our cigarettes to, let's say, such things as auto racing, we've had to keep track of them. Why is it that the cigarette companies ha are so linked to sports events? The truth is good, but juxtaposition is better. So um, I don't know of any kid who wants to be in school. Kids would much rather be out at the racetrack, you know, the auto racetrack or whatever. And that's where the cigarette companies are. There's no mystery to this. Anyone could sell cigarettes. I could sell cigarettes. Any moron could sell cigarettes to kids. And that's basically what we're just trying to show that there's no free lunch, that they don't give out t-shirts and hats for nothing. They do it so that you will wear that and you will identify with drug pushers, basically, is what they are. Okay. Didn't, I didn't pull out a good one there, but I pulled this Fox. one. Yeah, all over racing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Want to well. do that? Yeah. That's all right. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure that this kind the of The ghoul of your dreams, uh, Elvira, for I course. Just want to get to... I'm just going to make sure it's complete. We've been to over, I should have mentioned this, that, that would be crucial and it could go in any, we've been to over 30 tobacco sponsored events in Houston this year already, and we've missed quite a few. <laughs> this uh, was from the Greater Houston Partnership, this just came in the, ma in the, meal, uh, the mail test today, and the best part about it, just to pull this out and show you, is uh, it's a picture of Jonathan Day, a local city attorney and oh, probably one of, the, one of the biggest tobacco What are you standing guns? next to them? Yeah. Uh, he's standing next to the new superintendent of the Houston Independent School District. That's a With the president of the uh, Greater Houston Partnership. Truly disgraceful. So, and in the, in the context, this picture's out of context, it talks about a lot of the great environmental uh, and air quality work that the Greater Houston Partnership's involved in, when in fact this guy right here is involved. He's the basic, uh, he's the hack for the tobacco industry locally. Tobacco hack. Yeah. So, I think we should, uh, you know, send some letters clearly to Petrozella. Yeah. Because he's brand new and is probably not aware exactly of who he's playing he with right. uh, yeah. in this particular picture. So we can, we can clip this, photocopy it, label it, and send it to him, and maybe to the school board as well, because we've got some new people that have just been elected. So. Definitely. Yeah, I think that would work. He was the one that opposed us on the uh, bill to condemn Virginia Slims and uh, to stop the uh, targeting of minority groups. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the next thing really is coming up in a few days, and it's going to be a uh, uh, the Senate Bill 1088, which mm -hmm. deals with the tobacco products and liability and things like that. And the simple thing there, like a phone tree, contact the people that you know who can call their legislators and say, we need to support uh, Kennedy's Bill 1088, uh, because it's a, it's a way to go. It's a legislative move, and I think that would be something that would be helpful, again, spreading the word, letting people know what can be done. How many people do you think really support it? I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. We do know that one of our local congressmen, <coughs> Jack Fields, recently voted against uh, a health amendment. And that's, I can understand voting against an amendment, but the thing about it is he voted for a weaker tobacco-sponsored version. So that's inexcusable. Well, that you type expect of from an undertaker, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, I haven't heard much about that bill. So, like, if you're, if you're going to talk to people, no, well, thank you. That's yeah. what I need. <laughs> that's easy enough. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, a couple other things that I had on the list here. Ross we've got, is going to go through his whole agenda. I've got my yeah. agenda right, yeah, right here. here. We've got a, we've got two new uh, 
potential mayors here. Never been on around right, before. Sure. We don't know who they are. Yeah. Turner and Lanier. Let's find out what they're about. Let's set, let's let's schedule some meetings with them as medical students. And there's the Lung Association and yeah. Doc, and say, hey, let's uh, let's see where you stand yeah. on these issues. I would approach them from the billboard issue first, right? Because that's the you know the advertising of this stuff to minority groups is very important. Mm -hmm. Lanier is probably in tight with the billboard people because he's always been close to the roads. Well, he's a businessman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's a businessman. So I wouldn't think he'd be likely to do much. He won't want to appear any business, but you're right, Turner. I think would be yeah. the in there. Yeah. And, and we can use some of the friends that you've made, Alan. Uh, you know, uh, the Homer Ford Tennis Center coach. Yeah. 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 Uh, Leonardo Jones. Leonardo Jones. There's other folks that we can work with. Okay. So what's up with the med students? I mean, what are y'all doing? We are next week going to talk to some students at uh, one of the elementary schools around here. Uh, we sort of Cornelius Elementary, elementary School. Uh, and that's going to be a, the start of what we hope is going to be a larger campaign with a lot of the elementary schools and junior high schools uh, around the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, isn't the idea to adopt these schools and mm -hmm. keep right. going back and reinforcing, you know, not just do a one-shot deal, but keep reappearing and they remember your face, hopefully, and remember what you're about. You, you in effect, become their fam family right. physician. Mm -hmm. right. you, get to, you get to take care of them. The other thing we're doing is the uh, the uh, drug trading cards, because yes. uh, we're researching drug trading cards to give out to the kids that so they can trade around, and pick up a full set with all the facts, and also a, light, a lot of light humor for it. And uh, so what we're doing is is divide, dividing the cards up and trying to devise what what you're going to write, what 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 paragraphs we can put on these, and what kind of you know what information do we want them to get off the cards. Like and an emphysema slims card. Right. Yeah. That's Dakota Dakota. Yeah, no, no, if you didn't Martina know, that's Martina a project. That's a project sponsored or uh, funded by the Thrasher Research Fund in Utah. They funded that project for oh, Houston. Okay. So mm -hmm. just right. to let you know. Right. So the money's there. And the he money's there. Yeah. We're gonna have great. different cards that we can pass out to the students, and then hopefully they'll trade amongst each other so that they can each get a full set. Uh, and yeah. therefore, it'll be something that. Uh, that'll be fun for them, but they'll also be learning, and it'll, it'll be a long-term thing. So it's not just we're going to the school, giving a talk, showing slides, and then leaving, and the next day they forget about us. It's something that's lasting that we can leave with. Yeah, it's like trading cards, the, the best. Exactly. Yeah. Like jigsaw puzzle in the back, you know, when you turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all the big facts. What about the, this weekend? Because he's coming from Galveston. So the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, said that, that they, they've got this agreement now with Red Man chewing tobacco that they're not going to show the logo. So you go Saturday night taking pictures live and then we'll we'll get the tape of it because it's bound to be shown on TV somewhere yeah, TNN. and just basically expose whether or not they've done that and uh, also US tobacco with skull is still violating the law so uh, it's important to begin documenting that stuff that's right well they're already using the logo on the TV ads in Houston now I, mean, I was gonna say when yeah. does that go into effect because yeah. I've been watching TV and they yeah. haven't taken the commercial, it the commercials now ideally it went into effect in 1986 no one's been enforcing it so yeah. this is yeah, the yeah but time. isn't this I mean it's going to be newly in forced to get, right? right, right. I mean, All those commercials <laughs> saying, hey kids, come on out to the Red Man Shoe tractor pull, I mean, it's it's uh, mm -hmm. just nonsense, but that's what they're doing. You're right, they should have pulled it prior to the commercial. Maybe it takes effect in January. But, okay. uh, but they still have the Red Man Shoe, like, on the sides right. of the cars that they're yeah, showing they in. They're, they're claiming the monster it's a slightly different stuff. logo. You know, the name, what uh, they, they still allow them to use the name Red Man. Yeah. But what about the Astrodome itself? I mean, you know, why why just go after the tobacco people? I mean, it's got they're let in by the, by by the, the, the people that run the run the uh, Astrodome. They've so. got the permanent Marvel sign right. up next to the clock in the Astrodome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold it tighter so you put them wrinkle, okay? Good.